From the territorial days through the end of the Civil War, small communities of free people of color lived within the boundaries of Madison County, Alabama. A free person of color was someone of full or partial African descent, not enslaved. It is understood that communities of free blacks existed in this area earlier than Alabama statehood, because in 1805, around the time John Hunt would arrive at the Big Spring, laws within the Mississippi Territory allowed for emancipation. Census records indicate that in 1820, 569 free black individuals lived in Alabama, and by 1860, they numbered 2,098. In actuality, 99% of the black and mulatto population in Alabama were enslaved. Of the free people of color, 60% lived in five counties, Mobile, Baldwin, Tuscaloosa, Montgomery, and Madison. Most were in urban areas that offered more chances to work for a living and perhaps to blend in unnoticed. Despite an increase in the free black population in those early decades, the percentage they comprised within the total Alabama population decreased by 1860. This is most likely due to the progressively limiting laws surrounding emancipation and on the free black population itself. The Alabama Constitution of 1819 gave the right to grant manumission by petition to the legislature, and in its first session, 17 slaves were emancipated. Owners were still required to pledge bond as security for that freedman. Emancipation could be obtained by deed, will, or petition to the county courts. Local courts then assumed power over the rights and conduct of all free Black persons within its boundaries. Simultaneously, the General Assembly established a pass system, and no slave could legally leave his owner's premises without a signed note of permission. Any concerned white man could apprehend a Black person, whether free or enslaved, and deliver them to authorities for possible punishment. A patrol law to secure protection against possible slave conspiracies was also enacted. As time went on, Limitations surrounding the act of freeing became more strict up to requiring newly freed persons to leave the state within a year. The accumulation of this type of law led to heavy fines, harsh punishments, penalties of death, kidnappings for profit, and limitations on physical movement among other horrendous outcomes. So then, in Alabama, how did one become a freed man? Generally, owners emancipated those slaves whom they knew best, house servants and those with special skills. Manumission through an owner's will was legal if a means of support and preparation for free status was provided in the document. A trustee would be appointed to see to this, and some slaves received their freedom at the death of their master. While not uncommon, manumission by will became increasingly difficult over time, especially when white heirs were willing to refute claims in court, and when Alabama law did not allow widows to free their enslaved. Emancipation by public action might come as a reward for meritorious public service. However, these instances were rare and were notable exceptions to the strict oppressive laws. In Madison County, the most common emancipation examples appear to be slaves who were able to purchase their own freedom or that of family members. A slave who was allowed to hire out his own skilled labor or be allotted garden space to sell crops or other wares like butter or eggs might be able to save enough money to bargain for self-purchase. There were also those who chose to run, but often prices for recovery and the penalties were high for runaways. Most free people of color lived in towns clustered around other modest black and white, poor and working class people, but still convenient to upper class households who needed their services. 
Some in Madison County lived outside of the one square mile of Huntsville town limits and near Triana and in Madison Station. Like most of their white neighbors, freedmen's lives centered on work, family, and church. However, all of those activities became increasingly and systematically monitored and curtailed. Many free black individuals found great success in their trades like blacksmithing and barbering. Some in businesses that most whites were unwilling to perform like running livery stables. However, free black business owners, while often regarded as the top in their trade, had to act with the utmost humility, modesty, and reserve when dealing with the white population. Churches for the Black population, the earliest of which in Huntsville was St. Bartley's, and gatherings of more than six people were required to have a white person present to prevent the perceived possibility of planned uprisings. It was not unusual for the spouse and children of a free person to remain enslaved, and making the trip to a plantation to visit family became dangerous when institutionalized patrols lay in wait to catch legally free individuals unaware. Alfred Erskine achieved freedom through self-purchase in 1838. Dr. Alexander Erskine attests, I formerly owned the bearer, boy Alfred, who was 39 years of age at this time, five feet four and a half inches, of light copper color, generally termed a mulatto, hair bushy and straight, knock-kneed, quick of speech and brisk in his actions, has a scar on the under corner of his right eye, running up the side of his nose, a scar in the palm of the right hand and one on the right elbow, both produced by burns. On the left arm near the elbow joint and a slight contraction of said joint, and also the mark of a burn on the inner side of the left leg near the knee. By his great industry and savings, said boy Alfred years since, during which time he has been living in Alabama and Mississippi without having been emancipated by the laws of this state. The great difficulty in procuring an act of emancipation in Alabama is the reason assigned by him for immigrating to a non-slave holding state. A paper of his description is deemed necessary to prevent him from being arrested as a runaway on his journey to Indiana or any other free state. Amy Butcher, a free woman of color, went to court in Huntsville for herself and her grandchildren through her matrilineal line. They were directly descended through this line in Virginia from an Indian woman named Bess. Previously, Amy had brought suit for her freedom against a certain Booth Warren and his wife who, through fraud and artifice, deprived them of their liberty and held them in servitude. She, Amy, and others filed complaint in Chancery at Richmond in 1815, and the suits were decided in their favor. Thus, she and her daughter Katie, according to testimony, were free and living in Northern Virginia when James Dowell, or Sowell, kidnapped them and brought the two to Huntsville. He then sold the woman to Thomas Miller for a mere trifle, and Miller later sold Katie to Samuel Davis. As time passed and the case was not decided readily, Amy's descendants also included Lessie and Laurency, who claimed their freedom. The two women, in 1818, with Katie's children, brought suit in court for their freedom. If they were unable to establish their freedom, the plaintiffs were sure Miller and Davis would run them off to the lower country where Negroes commanded higher prices and sell them amongst strangers where it would be difficult, if not impossible, to establish their identity. Many respectable citizens in this county, who had been long acquainted with them, could attest to their freedom. This case would go on for several years. Shandy Wesley Jones was born in Huntsville in 1816, the son of a white man and a mixed-race free mother. 
The family later moved to Tuscaloosa, where he became a barber and a leading activist in the American Colonization Society. After the Civil War, and during the many attempts to wrest control of local politics, Jones was a candidate for a registration clerk of his district. It was said of Jones he was a freedman of good character and endowed with no ordinary mind, reliable and intelligent, every way acceptable to ourselves and the community. The opposition suggested, however, he plays sorter on both sides of the fence and his would-be friends thinks him very much of him. Jones went on to serve in the Alabama House of Representatives from 1868 to 1870. However, the times of the Reconstruction Congress could not contain the threats and violence by the Ku Klux Klan. Jones and his family fled to Moundville and eventually Mobile. There he was appointed by President Grant to the Customs Inspections Bureau. Milbury, a free woman of color, and Richard Bass entered into an indenture in May 1829. Her children Mary, Elvina, Henry, and Mahala Ann are in indigent circumstances, and being desirous of raising her children in honest ways, Milbury agrees to bind said children to Richard Bass as apprentices until each reaches the age of 21. He will instruct them in the art and mystery of farming or some other employment. He will furnish each necessary meat, drink, lodging, wearing apparel, and furnish each with a full suit of clothes at 21. To live as a freed person in Madison County was to live in a precarious balance between white citizenry and the enslaved black population. Free people of color were viewed with suspicion and fear by whites, and never totally accepted by the enslaved. They were, as one source put it, neither slave nor free. Although black and white people often lived side by side, the separation was unyielding.